And even if only one tenth of the people who participate in a mentoring program get a lot out of it, that's still huge compared to the vacuum that that person might have experienced without it. Hello, friends. You're back at the Faculty Factory podcast, and I'm Kim Skorupski, and I'm super excited to introduce and reintroduce to you a frequent flyer on the podcast, Janet Fickle. Hi, Janet. Hi, Kim. Great to be back. (laughs) Well, those of you who are new to the podcast, you are going to want to check out season number one, because now we're in four years into this, but back episode number 22, Janet Fickle, the thought leader, been in academic medicine for going on 50 years this year. She started off in 1972 at Brown, the, uh, their academic uh, medical, their medical school, right, Gina? Brand new in 1972. We graduated our first class in 75, so ground floor. <laughs> wow. So 50 years in this industry, and she is one of the top most nationally recognized leadership, career coach communication expert, again, thought leader, working on another really awesome book that is just so, so real and so deep and so inspirational. I hope she's going to touch on a couple of the topics on her really uh, great book that focuses on our career development, focusing inward, inside the life of our, in our own minds and our own lives, and then building community and reaching out and building, focusing together. So it's going to be a great book. I'm looking forward to the whole book. But Janet, why don't you, let's just kind of pause and you tell people, you know, who you are at this moment and what you want people to know about you. And then we'll just kind of launch into your message for us today. Okay. Thanks, Kim. And I, I have to start with high praise for all your work. I can't believe actually that there's another uh, faculty affairs and faculty development dean who has who is offering as much as you do to your colleagues i just was looking at snippets for success today on and it's just so useful for for faculty affairs deans uh, uh let me just start off by saying um because i won't try to summarize my career except that i was uh, at aamc for 25 years and left there to start my own business 20 years ago. At the, I was the founder of the Women in Medicine program beginning in the late 80s. And then in 1991, about Eleanor Shore, who was Dean for Faculty at Harvard, was knocking on AMC's door saying, we need a focus on faculty affairs and faculty development because there wasn't anything at AMC. And I was the staff person who responded, my two bosses, thought this was going to go away. And and I knew that this was the next really important thing. And so we started having meetings. And that's how the group on faculty affairs started in the early 90s. And one of my favorite sessions uh, that I enjoyed introducing was one we had at night on uh, with cocktails (laughs) on what keeps you awake at night. For the faculty affairs deeds, which probably I'm sure you still have at the, I haven't it. actually been to an AMC. Yeah, DFA that's deed. one of the that's one of the most beloved, I think, yes. elements of the professional development conference. Not only because it it highlights issues and burning issues and needs and sources of our anxiety and dread and concern for our faculty, but also because it brings us together. It is yeah. kind of at the end of the day, it is kind of a time for us all to like relax be more intimate and honest and real. Yeah. And it, it, there's something very, very special. It's kind of like the modern day version of sitting around the campfire. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. And and I'm sure that it's more important now than ever. Yeah. I mean, what I'm, uh, my, my current practice is mainly women leaders, most of whom have young children or other caretaking responsibilities. And of course, their lives were very challenging before the pandemic. And now, the in addition to the having to deal much more frequently with death um, and, and mortality and with the political divisions in our country and the science deniers, uh, it has made everything in terms of mental and physical and emotional health much more challenging for them. And... So naturally, your jobs 
are harder than ever because you're the leaders in the middle. You are leading from the middle in a way that no one else in your entire institution is because you see the nitty gritty granular of what faculty are going through and you understand the whole system that's creating your criteria and your policies and the RVU requirements. And so you're the translators, as you know, and given the crisis, the ongoing crisis in our country, and it's difficult to, you know, have the, the, uh, the resilience to, to be optimistic, but that's what's being asked of all of us is harder than ever. So sharing each other, you know, sharing your fear, sharing your concerns, because we can't solve problems we don't talk about. Isn't it ironic that you said that decades ago, when that Harvard, D- Harvard dean brought <laughs> That to the attention that there's nothing for faculty affairs and faculty <laughs> development. That the faculty are kind of important. <laughs> and the double AMC, you know, blessed our hearts thinking, oh, this will be like a flavor of the month. It'll go away. Isn't that the irony of all ironies that we've heard the, the saying, you know, leaders come and go, but faculty remain. <laughs> the academic medical centers, academia are the faculty. And so they're, the faculty are the lifeblood coursing through the veins. And when we have exactly. these, these blockages. Well, at the time though, life was quite a bit simpler. When you look back at the early nineties, when the first literature in academic medicine was starting to be, and uh, I led the first uh, survey on how promotion and tenure policies were changing on the incorporation of parental leave policies on those, those kind of issues, life was quite a bit simpler. And the deans and the department chairs really felt like they were on top of these issues. It was their responsibility. They were going to keep doing it. And then as things progressed, you know, the professionalism of the faculty affairs and faculty development staff and deans, in, you know, started being appointed. And, and uh, so it's changed. That's another thing to reflect on uh, how in 30 years, how much more complex everything has gotten. And so it's not our imaginations that this work keeps getting harder. Mm-hmm. Um, I like that observation because it also makes me think about science in general or medicine in general. And I was talking to a friend of mine who teaches um, calculus and, and and I was kind of talking to him and wasn't really focused as, as probably as much as I should have been. And I was reflecting on my lens through my framework of being, he works for the government, but because he's a math guy, he loves to teach. So he teaches part-time as an adjunct online teaching calculus. So my mind immediately went to my reflecting on when I was putting myself to graduate school, teaching 17 courses at three different universities and the complexity and keeping up on the literature and reading the books and being on, because I'm a sociologist, gerontologist, what's new, what's changing, what are the rates, what are the percentages, what are the proportions, always being up, 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 up and current. And so my mind started spinning and I'm starting to fire questions off at him trying to understand how he could have this big job in the government and then do this and mm. make it seem like it's not a big deal. And then he said, Kim, math is a known science. Mm. There's not, it's, it's known. The rules of calculus aren't changing. <laughs> so he said, there is, I said, and then I had to kind of, oh, I had to like kind of did a, a dog on a leash and <laughs> jerk my neck and my goodness. <laughs> Oh, that's right. I mean, math is math. I guess somebody who's like a math person out there is screaming right now going, no, I don't <laughs> Can't we, you know, talk to any you know parent right now. They're like, I don't even know how these kids are learning math. That's not the way I don't know multiplication tables. But anyway, he was saying his, his basic point was it's a known field that calculus is calculus is calculus. This, this is just the way it is. I don't have to read new articles or books to know what's new in the field of calculus when I'm trying to teach fundamentals. And it made me think, and just not right now, you're reminding me that that's, I think, some of the problem or some of the challenge in our society with the pandemic was that science was moving so quickly, which would lead some people to say, well, you don't know what you're talking about. One minute you're saying, don't wear a mask. Then you're saying, wear a mask. You're talking out of both sides of your face. You're making this all up without an appreciation of the fact that science moves rapidly and it's always changing and we're always testing hypotheses Mm -hmm. and the same with medicine our faculty members out there as you just said janet so 
on point is that, yeah, 20 years ago, maybe some deans and leaders and presidents were like, what is the big deal? Well, it's a big deal because what you just said, it's more complex. Medicine is changing and the electronic medical. Well, and academic medical centers are the most complex organizations in the world because they have multiple competing missions. And, and the dysfunction of American medicine, where the patient has never been the main focus. And we've got, you know, competing business plans of the pharmaceutical industry and the insurance industry combined with uh, all the other lobbying forces. Um, and, and it really is coming out of the heights of the faculty at this point, as what I'm hearing, a number of schools have, uh, have increased the number of clinical RVUs. You know, and and so the fun and the funding for for education and for research is in jeopardy as never before. It's been always threatened in the last few decades, but harder and harder for people to really be academic. And so I'm just hearing more about attrition, especially of women, because they feel as if they're not able to take care of themselves and their families under these conditions. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really seeing very much about that, you know, Mm -hmm. out in the literature about how we, you know, when I use the term resilience with women faculty, they go, are you talking about yoga? Yeah. (laughs) Because our schools, when they talk about wellness and professional well-being and all that, that's what we're hearing about. And and no, that's not what I'm talking about. And that's one of the main reasons why I decided to pour everything I know into a book now that I'm calling Not a Well-Lit Stare, Career and Human Development for Young and Growing Professionals. And and I would, in even though this is not targeted at academic medicine, naturally, because that's been my field for 50 years, uh, I would say it, the observations I'm putting in it are really apply as much to academic medicine as it, as it could to anything, because it's the most complex mm-hmm. jobs you can have um, uh, to be in an academic medical center. You, so. so I'm so excited about this book. And folks, Janet Pickle, just if, in case if you're curious, I want you to look her up, uh, B-I-C-K-E-L. And by the way, before I forget, because she is a coach and a leadership speaker and well-recognized on the circuit, been invited all over the country many, many times. It's Janet Bickle at Cox.net. Janet Bickle is one word, J-A-N-E-T-B-I-C-K-E-L at Cox, C-O-X dot net. Is that right, Janet? Yes, thanks very much. So Janet has over probably about 70 peer-reviewed publications right now, two books. This will be, I think it's the third. So Mm -hmm. give us some, what, where is some hope and what can we as leaders do for our faculty to empower them, to remind them, to just kind of embolden them? And what can we as faculty members, other than yoga and mindfulness and taking care of ourselves, what what can we hang our hats on? Well, as you know, you know, so the, uh, the junior faculty tend to be better mentored and, and more idealistic and have more energy and enthusiasm. What I'm finding is you it's the mid-career faculty who are, which is a challenging time anyway in medicine because so many of them have sacrificed, have given up their uh, other interests and in artistic interests and everything over the year. And now they're finding themselves needing to reassess their commitment. And now with the pandemic and, and so many unfilled spaces as they most, and this is one of the attractions of, of medicine for many of us, we're working with people who are so dedicated to their work and their students and their patients. And, and now with the uh, increasing uh, challenges with regard to mortality and death, um, assessing for the mid-careers people, assessing whether and how to manage to stay you know, I think is one of the most crucial things. So giving them as much support as possible for the reassessment process, that it's normal and that we need to talk more about the how normal it is to reassess one's commitment. Um, because if, as we all know, the symptoms and the results of burnout 
Um, and the term moral jeopardy, I think, is, is, is helpful. If faculty are spending too much time feeling as if they're, they can't live up to their values, then we have to help really give them the support that we can. I know you all do. I know you all do. But there's a couple ideas that, that I think are really um, helpful. And one is one, one of my favorite faculty affairs deans is um, Amelia Benjamin at Boston University. And she every year throws, uh, encourages her department chairs to throw a failure party where people bring their rejected grants and manuscripts and talk about what they've learned from those failures. Because as we know, failure and success are not opposite. We have a lot of failures in order to get any success. And, and she, one of the ways she takes care of the women, especially for the women, she throws a shameless self-promotion lunch <laughs> regularly. Love it. <laughs> where, because I don't know a woman who is uh, even some of the greatest leaders who have been totally, especially early on in their leadership careers, comfortable with talking about their accomplishments. And, and as you know, um, and as one of the, there are so many strong sections, I thought, in the Snippets for Success resource that, that you've helped to create. Um, and one is about uh, incorporating our strengths, is acknowledging them mm. and building on them and understanding the shadow side of them. Because those of us who are really empathic, for instance, may be too generous and then get resentful. Those kind of dynamics are so important. But helping women especially acknowledge and be able to talk about their strengths is, is really important. Well, you've given at least two really good ideas that anyone listening out there could implement. A failure party. <laughs> I'm, I'm envisioning this kind of like a, a happy new year or saying goodbye to the old and, and metaphorically. Yeah, just giving, yeah. giving people permission, you know, giving people permission and the shameless self-promotion. Yeah. And one of the things that I think is going to make my, my book, which I'll probably end up self-publishing because it's almost impossible to to get attention at age 72 from an agent. <laughs> well, this is like you keep, you're, you're very kindly promoting the free <laughs> ebook at the back of the, back of the snippets. You make sure you send us that link and we'll put it right in the back. Okay, super. Glad to hear it. Um, is I start in a place that very few other career development books that are leadership development books that I've ever found start, which is facing our fears and learning from our fears mm -hmm. and appreciating that vulnerability is probably the center of meaningful human emotion. Um, it's really ironic, uh, isn't it, that most of us spend our time trying to look as strong and put together and smart as possible when it's really our flaws that other people <laughs> want to know about. And then because that, that gives them permission to open up a bit. And since, since time is always of the essence and since our energy and our attention span is so taxed, right now. We need to be able to get to the core of meaning as quickly as possible. And so to be able to be authentic with each other, right, right from the bat. And, and I have found in, in my own life that learning to befriend myself and to develop that sense of self-acceptance, which then allows a self-compassion, which then allows greater compassion for others, that kind of opening up process is the most important area of skill development. And so how we can help people get to that point a little bit better. Um, Wonderful. So yeah. important. And, and also the, the, the other thing I, I want to emphasize and uh, is how we become more skilled at bridging differences, all kinds of differences, you know, not just the ones that are most uh uh, in the, on our radar, the racial differences, gender differences, um, the political differences, but all of our differences. And uh, one of the articles of all my, my peer-reviewed ones that I'm proudest of was published in the Journal of Women's Health this year called uh, Getting Somewhere New Together, 
you know, how to dialogue about differences. That was published in the number six in June. And how that's the foundation of everything. And that's another area of your snippets for success under communication. I found just really a lot of excellent resources on. Well, well you, you, one of your other um, number one fans that we, we all kind of fight and buy to have the title of the Janet Bickle number one fan. But one of your other <laughs> big fans is my friend and colleague here, Dr. Rachel Levine. And I've loved Rachel's approach for so many years. And it's, um, she says, ask curious questions. Mm -hmm. So not just asking questions, but she always says, ask curious questions. And so just as soon as you started saying that in terms of appreciating differences to me, brought that reminder to my head. Oh, really? I'm curious. Tell me more about that. Or I want to understand more. Can you help me understand that better? Or, well, I'm curious. I want to. Uh, I'd love to hear more about that. So mm -hmm. she does that a lot. And it's a good reminder that is always, I try to remember instead of going into auto mode of like, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. And like I kind of start lining up my, my you know, rebuttals okay. rather say, okay, let's be curious about this. The other thing, great thing about Rachel that I've talked about before on this podcast is she schedules into her week, deep thinking. She actually scheduled it in her week, like me with the, the WAGs, the writing accountability groups. We had scheduled writing. If you don't schedule, it's not going to get done. She schedules deep thinking. And I loved it during one talk when she first presented this to our faculty. Someone said, well, what do you do during that time? And she just says, I think deeply. <laughs> a little pause. Uh, no, that's great. I'm so glad you mentioned that because from my perspective, the most important ingredient to resilience is creating some kind of cessations, even if it's just an hour a week where you take that whole backpack of responsibilities off and you are not your role. You are just a human being who wants to better understand yourself, your, your own fears, um, and, and in a going forward kind of way. And, and one really good question for reflection is and, and having these questions and making notes for yourself so that during that hour or God bless us a whole day and night where you have no relational responsibilities. Uh, I mean, it's so critical. It's the hardest thing for anybody I know to achieve, but it's the most critical where you can ask yourself, what are my contributions to what I complain about? For instance, mm -hmm. Um, what what do I get defensive about yeah. and why? Um, what can I more, more overtly appreciate? Who do I need to thank? Yeah. You know, those kind of questions that I really recommend everybody make time for on an annual basis, at least like on your birthday or New Year's Day or something. And I have a whole list of questions like that. that are one, of those, one of my favorite Janet Bickle questions for reflection that I have on a sticky note here in my computer is what do you understand now that you didn't before? Good, good. What do you understand now that you didn't before, which has so many layers of meaning. <laughs> and one of the layers is always to remind me to not get too torn up about things. It's like, I just don't understand this. This is crazy. Yeah. I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. This is complete yeah. nonsense. I don't understand it. And, and that that that's why it's so important to understand and build on our strengths because it makes it a lot easier to accept all the things we're never going to be good at. And then the question is, how, how do we better partner? Who can we partner with? Um, who can I delegate to? <laughs> how and how do we? Uh, another question that's directly related to those kind of delegation questions and to incorporating building on our strengths. How do I get the feedback I need? Mm. That's something that I don't see addressed very much, and it is harder for women mm. um, who hold themselves usually to higher standards, who tend to get negative feedback about a personal characteristic that mm. men just don't get feedback on and it's, and it's usually negative. Um, so it's harder for women. And I think we need to, to help each other get better at asking for feedback. And if we set, you're so right. And if we set a culture of the, rather than this being stigmatized of giving bad and bad yeah. feedback, we set up a culture of an expectation of tell me one thing I can do better. Yeah. And when we ask for feedback, 
we, it, the, the onus should partly be on us in creating this culture of saying, will you please give me feedback about my fill in the blank? Yeah, my, exactly. My, my, especially my, communication skills. How, and, and what do I, um, when do I over function? When do I under function? Those kind of the general and yet invitational questions. And and when we ask those kind of questions, we're doing three things really. We're demonstrating commitment to our own development. We're demonstrating respect for the person we're asking. And we're role modeling behavior that if, if everybody was better at asking for feed, specific feedback, not you know pat on the back, how am I doing? Um, we could really change our, our, help to change our culture. And that's the, one of the biggest problems right now. There's not as much time or space for collegiality building, you know, and, and that's one of the big downsides to Zoom that I think we need to uh, to focus more on as useful as it is, obviously, during this time, is that we, we, we're only changed by what touches us. And, and without the physical presence, less touches us. That's just the way it is. So that's why everybody's exhausted at five o'clock, you know, because it takes so much more energy to when you're not face to face and and it would be great to hear how people are managing that you know what have you learned about how to make zoom work for you and to overcome the obvious limitations i haven't heard a discussion of that well that, that's that's so many good thoughts and of course and everybody knows me on this podcast i just kind of tend to tend to meander i was talking to a friend of mine here i go a little a meander and he's after we hung up he said, David Rogers from Alabama, he's like, no, this is great. You're fine, Kim. You're just, you're just like my wife. She just kind of goes here and there and rambles around, rambles around. And I just kind of wait for her to bring it down to the to the point. And I said, well, kudos to your wife and, and thank your wife for me because um, we are sisters. But I, because my brain gets starts firing off with so many ideas. But, <laughs> so what we do with the Zoom is we, we initially here at Hopkins tried something like literally a picture, a slide of a water cooler or the coffee, the Keurig machine in a kitchenette and said, hey, before the session, we're going to have the, the breakout room open, hang out, shoot the breeze, touch base, meet somebody new, have your proverbial cup of coffee, your figurative cup of coffee here. And then after the session, we'd open up optional breakout rooms. And you know, they're just not working. A couple people, a couple looky loos would do it. And then to me, it, it was so sad because I'm an extrovert. So it's like throwing a party that nobody comes to. So it really made me feel sad. And it also reemphasized the, the stressors and the efficiencies of like, no, I like the Zoom. I can click in, click out. And the, the common refrain is that no, we're just, we don't have time to socialize. We don't have time to do this kind of stuff. We have so many competing obligations and so many uncompensated efforts. I don't have time to, I wish I did have time to have a yeah. coffee. Yeah, or- because there's less, there, there's less obvious take home. Yeah. And you don't, like you said, mm-hmm. you don't organically when you would be in the restroom, even at work. Yeah, right. Oh my gosh, how are you doing? Jan? I haven't seen you in a while. You would at least chit chat for 30 seconds or yeah. in the hallway. So since, yes. Yeah. Since we can't do that. I, uh, and since, well, my my uh, take on this too is that the most sensitive kinds of conversations are not being held because we know that we're going to, you know, when we need to talk about something difficult, uh, uh, yeah. we're going to miss clues um, if we just have the person's face and voice. Mm-hmm. Um, and how to get better at that, at, at having those kind of, maybe there's something we can learn from now all the online therapy that's going on um, and from uh, how are the, the, the therapists <laughs> coping with the lack of physical presence? What are they learning about that? How well, to- you know, that's another interesting point because, and those of you listening, come on, email me at facultyfactorykim <laughs> at gmail.com, facultyfactorykim at gmail.com. If you want a question answered or nobody, somebody could talk about this, but you're right. You will always hear and many, many of us will affirm that oftentimes it's the last few minutes of the hour meeting that a therapist, advisor, coach, mentor, sponsor, best friend will hear the real problem or the real challenge because we all put on this superficial base of, I do, Kim, I'm fine. How are you, Jennifer? Everything's good. Nobody wants to burden anybody with their drama. 
Mm-hmm. And then you're trying to be tough and put on the brave face and you're, we're all exhausted. We all have people, yeah. we're all discouraged and dismayed, but we all got to, you know, soldier on yeah. and to the detriment of something real and authentic, which is what you said a little bit ago. That that's I, it. I wonder too, although I, I've experienced that small groups on Zoom can go pretty deep when the people know each other and have had some some time together and the kind of bridging differences discussions we need to be having where people, when we, we ask a small group that's that we have helped formed to talk about, for instance, how gender has influenced their professional development or how their race has, and, and what are the ramifications of that and get people talking we can learn from each other in this environment that way. You're right. That's what I, one of the second like, unanticipated benefits of the WAG, the Writing Accountability Group, was a committed group of four to eight people meeting every week for 10 weeks. And lo and behold, what do you think happens after a four small group of you meet every week? You bond, you get connected. Janet, yeah. we missed you last week. Where were you? Oh, I had no, exactly you next week. You exactly. Bond. So you can talk about more and more sensitive subjects. And that's what we need more of. I think to because so many of you, you know, had up until the pandemic had put so much effort and successfully connected people in faculty development sessions throughout the year where new new relationships formed, new partnerships where people were really getting an opportunity to to practice the skills of bridging differences, right? With people from other departments and other schools. And so I know some of that's going on on Zoom and we we need a way of learning about what's working and what's not working um, in that regard. Like what's the optimum group size for talking about something that, where there's a fear factor? Is it really possible to have a leadership development program with over 30 people who are on one Zoom uh, you know, don't we have to break it down? Because yeah. my experience is that 12 is the maximum for that kind of group bonding. Yeah. So um, Jean, um, I hope this won't take you too far off, but I'm thinking while we have you, you know, 50 years here and, and just thinking so deeply about these topics, what is the, what is some, a piece of the convincing argument we make to not only leaders Mm-hmm. At the highest levels, the deans, the directors, uh, the division directors, the senior faculty, and to the early career faculty and the mid career faculty. How do we make the case that investment up front in this, whatever this is, small community building, career mm-hmm. building, um, building your tribe, um, being mm-hmm. authentic, how do we make that um, pitch? to help people understand when they're thinking, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? You're asking me to do one more thing I need to do? That if we do this now, that it will pay off. What are the, what are the rewards? I'm thinking a couple metaphors of like investing. Now you're like, you want me to take $10,000 and invest it here? What is, what is the probability that that's going to pay off? Or you want me to train this new staff person and spend all these hours training him to do this and that? Are you kidding me? I'd just rather do it myself without thinking, wait a minute. Okay, so you're telling me to invest thus and such right now. And what am I, what can I expect? Initial outcomes, middle, you know, short-term outcomes, long-term outcomes. What can we, can you help me kind of articulate what I'm trying to get at? Because I feel like, I don't know. I feel like there's some amount. Well, of- it all depends. You know, we we can't uh, we can't convince people to do something that isn't in accord with their own perceptions and values. <laughs> so, you know, just just keeping that in mind, and that every every person has a different set of needs and values and goals, and trying to understand first, <laughs> asking the curious questions that will give us clues about what drives this person. What evidence would they find convincing? Um, what examples do I need to be able to help them see what I see? <laughs> you know, rather than uh, using arguments, for instance, to try to convince somebody. I've never found that. Most of us like to make up our own goddamn minds. You yeah. know? <laughs> so, you know, this, this brings me to this back to a concept I had a couple of years ago that I presented at the GFA PDC as precision faculty development. <laughs> 
precision medicine, precision education. Yeah. If, if, if in fact we're going to follow this train of thought, which I agree with, by the way, that each of us has our own core values, our own perceived um, high profile needs and goals and perceptions, as you say, what in the world are we doing with delivering standardized faculty development programs? Yeah. Should we then be tailoring to what <sighs> Janet Bickle's unique needs and values are at this stage of her career? while recognizing, hello, that of course they're core fundamental development concepts. Like everyone's going to need to understand how do you get promoted at your place? Why would you bother to get promoted? Who cares about careerism? Why does it matter? Leadership. Of course, there are fundamental principles, but then the offshoots, the branches, all the little, the little twigs and the leaves, isn't that where precision faculty development? Don't we need both? I mean, it's both and. You know, some some things are 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 easy to articulate, and other things are really going to depend on where the person is in their own yeah. head, <laughs> right? And because maybe, back to the the the, the Janet Bickle quote was, "What do you understand now that you didn't before?" So I'm envisioning so many faculty members who will be at a certain stage of their career and be in sitting, find themselves sitting on a Zoom, a, a seminar, a workshop, a leadership course, rolling their eyes inwardly because they're too polite to do it outwardly, mostly. <laughs> And go, really? But then later on, you go, oh, now I get it. Now I understand why knowing myself. Well, that's, that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to measure the impact of anything that any faculty development person does. It's because a lot of times we're planting seeds, you know, and even if only one tenth of the people who participate in a mentoring program get a lot out of it, that's still huge compared to like the vacuum that that person might have experienced without it. That's what you said in episode 22. You <laughs> did I hear the good that you do, you just have to believe. Yeah. That's what you said. And so clinicians and all these, you know, the practitioners and the researchers, the basic scientists, yeah, when we're trying to find you know, measurable outcomes, if nothing you can't measure, it's not worth doing. Yes, and there's yeah. things you tell a yeah. person something to quit smoking for 40 years. You don't know what's going to. That's something. Well, leadership yeah. development and leading from the middle, especially as all faculty affairs deans do, you know, it's very difficult to, to, to measure the impact of that since each of you is in a fairly unique system, as many problems as we share. <laughs> the history and the current configuration and the current leaders, it's pretty unique. And, and so being able to what it takes to lead from the middle in your particular environment. One thing that I just I just want to remind, uh, I think we can't say this often enough, is that you can't measure the good that you do. Right. You know, and um, uh, a faculty member, it was at Hopkins about 10 years ago in a session I was leading, said she started off every morning by asking herself, who am I going to disappoint today? <laughs> because she knew you know, she knew she was going to disappoint probably many people, including herself, but certainly her students and her patients and <laughs> oh her team. God. And just to be able to accept that the uh, bar is so high and it keeps getting higher. And if we measure ourselves uh, <laughs> according to what we can't achieve, um, it's just a recipe for burnout. And so accepting the hum both the humanity, the imperfectibility of everything we do, and then, you know, which is a form of befriending ourselves, right. you know, and extending yes. our agility, our hardiness, our resourcefulness. I mean, it's all together. But also to know that we can't measure the good that we do just by showing up as the person that you are, the helper, <laughs> the professional the, eager the humble, people. authentic person who's also willing to say, oh, my gosh, Janet, you won't believe what I did. I made the silliest mistake or that sharing with our patients and colleagues and trainees and that human frailty yeah. allows, well, I imagine, other people in the room to exhale. And talking about what's what's tough, you know, um, <laughs> what are you learning the, about what's hard? It's a, it's a good question. Um, in addition to, at my age, asking our friends, what hurts? Oh. <laughs> you know, just starting off that way, you know, what's hard? Yeah. 
Um, I don't know what am I, who am I going to disappoint today? Just let's get that off the table. And also, <laughs> who am I going to, you know, surprise today? What, yeah. you know, who, who will be, um, and, and thank, who, who can I thank today? Yes, today. Yeah, that, that I haven't thanked recently, um, is a really good one too. Yeah. Um, because that's, that's one thing we are learning a lot more about what it takes to well, in addition to overcome our perceptual bias, you know, what it takes to maintain a positive focus. Mm. I mean, that's different for each of us, but the emotional intelligence piece, we're learning a lot more about uh, how to remain intelligent in the face of challenges and, you know, being devalued because we all, all will be. And there are a lot more good examples of that, I would say, in in our environments now than, than there used to be. And learning from people who are able to stay centered, even when they feel really challenged, and to be able to, to talk about what, what we're learning yeah. about that. Great stuff. Well, well, Janet, uh, this has been a wonderful, wonderful episode. <laughs> Friends in the Faculty Factory land, you definitely want to check out Janet Bickle's episode number 22. It'll be in the link on facultyfactory.org. You're going to shoot me an email, facultyfactorykim at gmail. If you have a question that you'd love some of our brilliant people to answer, if you want to be in the podcast, if you know someone who wants to be in the podcast, come on, don't be shy. We're building a community here. And I do want to remind you that Janet was so nice to remind me about was the free ebook on the snippets. We took the best of all the snippets from year two. I think that was year two. We're also working on a free ebook from the Triple H series, The Habits and Hacks from Hopkins. That's coming too. But Janet's new book is going to be coming out soon. She's going to give it to us and we're going to post it, a link to it on the Faculty Factory podcast. Janet is, you can reach her at Janet Bickle. Remember Janet Bickle, J-A-N-E-T, B-I-C-K-E-L at cox.net, C-O-X.net, because she is a leadership and career coach, guru, thought leader in our field, 50 years in the field. Wow, (laughs) Janet, um, I'm going to shut up and let you partless whatever goodbye or comment or thought you have. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Kim. This has been a great experience for me, too. I would just like to remind folks of my 2016 article in academic medicine on how mid-career faculty can reinvigorate um, and how we can help them in that regard with this reassessment, because that's where I find is the most pain right now and how to help support those individuals. Um, that, that's one of the things about our um, increasing emphasis on, on health and longevity. Some of these highly valuable professionals who are really struggling right now probably still have 20 or more years even of, of health. And if we can keep them from burning out, they may be continuing to practice into their 70s and 80s, highly skilled people, if we can retain them somehow during this crisis uh, so that they at least want to come back after they get over their, their burnout from the current situation is, would be a big deal. Janet, you told us last time it's never too late to invigorate. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.